All right. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to the DAR Museum Online. I am Sarah Kirspell. I'm the coordinator of museum engagement and outreach here at the DAR Museum. And today we are going to hear from Dr. Sarah Ann Carter. She is the executive director of the Center for Design and Material Culture and an associate professor of design studies in the School of Human Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So she's got uh, many hats that she's wearing. And she's here as a part of our monthly Tuesday talk lecture series. We present this the second Tuesday of the month. Uh, this series highlights topics related to the DAR Museum collection from decorative arts to so American social history to best practices and object preservation. We run the whole gamut. Uh, for our presentation today, uh, we are in the webinar format. So you can use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for our presenter, and how that'll work is you put the question in there. And then at the end of her presentation, I will ask those uh, questions to Sarah, to, <laughs> to Dr. Carter, and um, we will then get those questions answered. So you're welcome to put them in any time, uh, but we won't answer them till the end. So it's possible that your question gets answered during the course of the presentation, uh, but we'll make sure that we cover all that material. Uh, everything else uh, should be not disabled, but if you, uh, you shouldn't be able to raise your hand or anything like that, but if you want to, you're more than welcome to put your where you're from in the participant, participant information next to your name, just so we get an idea of where people are joining us from. And, uh, oh, and if you're interested in our other programs, we have a whole list at our website, www dar.org slash museum. You can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, we have family programs, Girl Scout programs, tours, evening events. Up next is our annual symposium. It's on November 4th, and it's based on our current exhibition to supply a nation, which is up through December. And so we hope you can join us. There are both virtual and in-person options available. You can check that out on our website. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Ann Carter. She is the executive director, as I said, at the Center for Design and Material Culture, but she's also an associate professor of design studies at the School of Human Ecology for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. At UW, she teaches courses on historic interiors, the material culture of childhood, the material culture theory and methods. She previously served as curator and director of research at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee, where she curated many museum exhibitions and led the Think Tank program in support of progressive curatorial practice. But she's here today as the author of Object Lessons, How 19th Century Americans Learned to Make Sense of the Material World. Uh, she's also the co-author of Tangible Things, Making History Through Objects, and the co-editor of a 32 essay collection, The Oxford Handbook of History and Material Culture. So she's currently collaborating with Marina Motzkowitz, to lead a workshop and produce an edited volume on the material histories of home economics. And last summer, she was the Summer Humanities Research Fellow at UW where she's working on a new book project, Museum Feelings, an Emotional History of the American Museum. So I will turn it over to uh, Sarah and I will disappear, but I will be here to if you need me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's such a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully um, you'll be able to see my presentation. All right, can you see that okay, Sarah? Yes, we can. Perfect, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm coming to you from Wisconsin, though I am uh, from Boston um, originally. Um, so it's still morning here. So good morning, good afternoon, whatever part of the country or world you're joining us from today. Um, as Sarah said, I am a historian, I'm a curator, I'm a professor, and at the heart of all this, I'm really a material culture scholar. So throughout my career, I've focused on um, how do you create history through objects? What does it mean to think about the connections between objects and ideas? How do we understand the intellectual content of the material world around us? And so these days I do this um, through my work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I run the Center for Design and Material Culture. 
And this is a really exciting center that focuses on, yes, the study of material culture. And we have a fantastic exhibition up right now called Questioning Things, which looks at um, a whole range of amazing objects from across campus. Um, we also focus on the study of design research and design thinking. So teaching our students how to solve problems creatively. Um, and to do that, you know, we have this wonderful Dorothy O'Brien Innovation Lab, and we think about problem solving in all kinds of creative ways with my interdisciplinary colleagues. And then we also have a truly amazing textile collection. So um, the Helen Louise Allen Textile Collection um, is one of the real um, jewels in the Center for Design and Material Culture. And this is a 13,000 object global textile collection. So with all of these wonderful opportunities and with a whole team of amazing colleagues, I'm thinking a lot about objects and how we tell stories with objects and how we engage with material things. Um, I teach classes in material culture, curate exhibitions, and um, really think a lot about how do we make meaning out of objects. And this, <clears throat> this part of my practice, this work that I do, um, is closely connected to what's been a long-term research passion of mine. So um, for many years, um, I researched the history of object lessons and histories of how do we find information from material things. Um, and this research resulted in a book that I wrote um, called Object Lessons, How 19th Century Americans Learned to Make Sense of the Material World. And it's connected to my ongoing research in these areas as well. Uh, so, this project really led me to think about interesting ways in which like children engage with the material world and how we teach children to engage with the material world. So I'm really interested in how we engage with things sort of beyond, um, you know, beyond reading, beyond writing, beyond arithmetic in the classrooms so and thinking about how children were taught to engage with objects in the classroom. And this became a really interesting and meaningful way for me to think about American material and intellectual life um, over the course of the long 19th century. Um, and my research into object lessons has really helped me think about like what are productive ways to build strategies for object engagement and thinking about the material world in today's classroom. So, you know, I wish I could ask all of you this, um, but I'd love for you to think about this question. Um, you know, how many of you have heard the term object lesson, right? Um, you know, maybe you've heard object lesson being used as a metaphor, as something that uh, describes, you know, any, any way of reasoning from something concrete to something abstract. The word or the phrase object lesson is something that's really often used. Um, you know, you might read it in the New York Times or hear it um, in a news story on the radio um as you know a, a common metaphor kind of like a teachable moment or something that you know it's a compelling example but long before it was this uh, metaphor it was actually a concrete classroom practice and it was a concrete classroom practice that taught young people to engage with material things like these ah Thanks for the poll, Sarah, that's cool. Um, taught young people to engage with material things like these, um, you know, in, in a very concrete way. So instead of teaching children um, through memorization or rote learning, object lesson practice actually brought material things into the classroom. Um, and this was something that hadn't really been explored or studied before I started working on this many years ago, actually, as part of my doctoral dissertation at Harvard. Um, and I came across 19th century textbooks and really cool materials like these object lesson boxes that were quite curious. And they really weren't in the material culture literature at the time. And they weren't really part of conversations in history of education, which intrigued me trying to figure out what's going on here. What are these things? How do we make sense of these objects? And my research quickly showed me as I learned more about these kinds of weird boxes of objects. Um, and I'm sure those of you who are able to look closely at this, you know, you're like, huh, there's blue and white ceramics. Um, oh, look, we have, um, you know, various kinds of textiles, you know, a pair of scissors, all these um, interesting and unusual things. Like, you know, this was not part of the way people were talking about 19th century um, pedagogy. 
Um, and so, you know, as I started to learn more about these kinds of objects and finding textbooks and other 19th century curricular sources um, about object lessons, and here's another example of one of these boxes, and you can look inside at some of the cool materials that were used in these classrooms. Um, my research showed me that metaphorical understanding of the phrase object lesson um, was really only its secondary definition, and that indeed, a primary definition was one that was really quite interesting. And this is one of those cases where, you know, when I finally went ahead and looked object lesson up in the dictionary, I was like, oh, wait a minute. There's actually an historical set of practices that has been completely critically ignored in the literature on this topic. You know, an object lesson is a lesson in which um, the pupil's examination of a material object forms the basis for instruction. And that became the metaphor that we know it to be today. And in fact, the success of this metaphorical term has hidden this whole early history, which um, is really quite fascinating. And it's that early history that I'll be sharing with all of you today. So the study of object lessons really offers a way of finding ideas and things. And this is a history that we take for granted when you know we see or explain things around us simply as symbols or metaphors. And this process has a really fascinating history that can help us understand how ideas are so often present in and connected to material things in the 19th century. So the place where I like to start thinking about object lessons is, um, is in the classroom of this man named Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. You know, these very, it's very unorganized and kind of wild classroom. Um, Pestalozzi was a romantic pedagogue from Switzerland. Um, and he's seen here in this posthumous painting. Um, and he was a working, you know, at the turn of the 19th century. So this is years after Pestalozzi died in 1827. Um, and he had developed classroom practices premised on what he viewed as a mother's approach to teaching. He wrote about this in his 18th century books on a mother named Gertrude. Um, and mothers, he observed, really tried to draw information out of children rather than cram empty ideas into them. So as historians of education have detailed when talking about Pestalozzi, um, he was really interested in child-centered learning. And his work had a really significant impact on how 19th century Americans understood pedagogy. In his teaching and writing, he emphasized this concept called Anschauung. And Anschauung is a German word that translates roughly into sense training. Okay? And Anschauung Unterricht is um, a word that roughly translates into sense perception exercises. So Anschauung, sense perception, and Unterricht, these exercises. And this is really a close translation for what becomes object lessons. So in Pestalozzi's model, Children were supposed to learn about the world through sensation, so through the kinds of objects that I was sharing. And then they would learn um, about like perception, understanding what is it they're looking at, understanding notion, what are the ideas connected to these things? And then finally, volition. How might you learn to act morally based on your own view of the world, um, You know, thinking about what you're engaging with and what choices you can make through that engagement? And this child-centered pedagogy really explicitly linked learning to observe and learning to engage with things, which learning had with learning how to think and reason. And this was something that was a really big part of 19th century um, educational theory and approach. So in um, Pestalozzi's classroom, um, you know, he's shown here really just like looking, engaging, looking closely at these children, engaging with them, um, really searching their faces. And, you know, the idea is he's trying to draw information out of them, um, engage with them, think about how they might be able to learn in a world that's about material connection and exploration. So, you know, he isn't the person who invented the notion that children learn through their interaction with the world. Um, you know, going back to someone like John Locke, um, whose theories about understanding and perception, um, you know, which were really exemplified in his really famous description of the human mind as a sheet of blank paper, right? Um, imprinted upon by experiences, that tabula rasa idea that many people have probably heard about. And these ideas made this sort of pedagogy possible. 
A Pestalozzi, who's shown here, was also kind of your classic early 19th century romantic era hero. And what I mean by that was that, you know, he was a bit of a mess, right? He was never wearing his shoe buckles, his socks were always falling down. Um, he was um, like quite literally a bit of a mess in his classroom and the work he was doing. And he often talked about um, how he was dealing with um, mental confusion and kind of just like the complexity of everyday life of working with all of these children um, in stance. And he often talked about how he was unable to, you know, put down, you know, a very clear thought without having something concrete that he was working with. And in a lot of ways, you know, this is part of why I think he found the object lesson idea so appealing. So he wasn't really able to write about this material, but many of his students, his adult students, the teachers who came to learn from him were. And they found his ideas of moving from sensation to perception to notion and then volition. So moving kind of from a material thing to learning how to reason and think about the world, they transform those ideas into really interesting educational systems that then intersected in meaningful ways with the common school movement in the United States and a whole range of various colonial projects um, around the world that were really implemented through um, the home and colonial schools in England um, throughout the British Empire. And so these ideas became scalable in some really interesting ways. And in particular, um, a young man named Charles Mayo came to work with him. Um, Charles Mayo came from the England to work with Pestalozzi. And when he returned home to England, he set up a school with his sister, Elizabeth Mayo. And through the Home and Colonial School Foundation, um, they really spread this pedagogy um, throughout the world. And so they translated Pestalozzi's rather, um, you know, uh, you know, loose ideas into a very clear and set pedagogy that became the foundation for object lessons. So in their ideas, you would start with observation. So looking closely at something, you would then study an object for its qualities. You would then study an object for qualities that cannot be, be discerned merely through the senses. Then you would classify objects and then you would write about them. So when I teach students about this in my own classes, I often um, do this like with a hunk of ginger, right? I bring a whole bunch of ginger into my material culture classes. I give everyone a piece and we go through this lesson and we think about what can we observe, right? What are the qualities of this material, of this hunk of ginger in your hands, what qualities um, cannot be discerned merely through close looking in the senses? How might we classify it? And then how might we write about it? And this was an example that was also used in the 19th century object lesson books of Charles and Elizabeth Mayo, right? They would describe um, the actual physical qualities of ginger, then what are qualities that cannot be discerned merely from the senses? Then you might think about how would you classify it and then write about it. So this approach to studying, um, you know, something like a hunk of ginger could also be applied to studying really any object in children's lives. And for those of you who are familiar with material culture practice, this is, you know, very similar to a lot of material culture approaches too. This is very similar to say the Brownian method or to some of the methodological ways we might engage with material things as material culture scholars. Um, but in a 19th century context, this really became something that was um, central to 19th century pedagogy. And in classrooms in the 19th century throughout the US and indeed around the world, lessons on objects became a lesson that was offered alongside all of the other lessons in your curriculum. And in order to do this work, educators could purchase those cabinets that I shared with you earlier. You know, you could order, um, order your very own mahogany cabinet filled with all of the substances included in an object lesson textbook. So you could have your own collection of teaching objects, in many ways, your own little museum that would allow you to do this interesting hands-on pedagogical work. So for example, if we zoom in on one of these drawers of objects, you can see all kinds of things, whether it's a hunk of ivory or a piece of honeycomb, a jar of quicksilver, brown sugar, whalebone. These are objects that you think of that if you think of them through that five-step process, 
they all have really interesting different material qualities that would help you define what they are. Um, and then through comparison, you begin to think, wow, what is it to compare horn and glass or um, a pine cone and fir? Like what are the different material qualities? And then what are the different things that are associated, the things that might not be associated, it might not be able to determine just through your senses, right? And what bigger cultural stories might those possibilities open up? So in the classroom, students were instructed to engage with these kinds of material things. And through this process, the idea was that they would learn to move from observation to what we today in the 21st century would talk about as critical thinking skills, right? Um, object lessons were adopted in the United States, um, you know, really in the 1860s through the work of a man named E.A. Sheldon, um, who was inspired by the Mayos and inspired by um, people who worked with the Mayos. Um, and he translated their ideas yet again. In his case, one of the main images that he used was this image of a tree. And he argued, if you can see in the small print at the base of the trunk of this tree, that all learning is rooted in the education of the senses. And that it is in starting with the education of the senses, moving up through perception, that you get to all of these higher order modes of thinking, whether it's perception of order or ideas about cause and effect or ideas about how do we understand difference. All of these uh, more complicated ways of thinking about the world, Sheldon and others argued, were really rooted in an understanding of material things. And that to do that, you had to have a wide range of sensory experiences, you know, to go back to Locke, you know, perhaps your mind had to be stocked with a whole range of ideas. And so the object lesson boxes and object lesson um, curricula were one way to do this. And it really rooted pedagogy in the 19th century in an understanding of material things. A big part of this was also making an argument against rote learning which was a big part of 19th century education. And sometimes when I, uh, when I think about this history, it feels so relevant today as we're so often still concerned about rote learning or memorization or just remembering terms that are understanding concepts. The object lesson idea was really designed to say, no, we wanna think about not just memorization, not just um, you know, an empty word, but how do we understand that word or that concept as connected to a real material thing? How do we understand the role of observation and the senses in really thinking about um, the world and then learning how to think critically as well? And so rote learning was really a problem for these pedagogues to solve. So overall, the idea here was not that knowledge, you know, necessarily rests in material things or that you're memorizing ideas connected to things, right? But that um, through accessing material things and training the senses, young people would learn how to think critically. And I like to think about how we might apply some of these concepts in a museum context as well. Like how important it is for young people to be able to engage with material things, you know, not just digital things, but to engage materially um, in museum contexts and in thinking about the importance of objects um, to, to education more broadly. And so starting with sensation and the roots, you move up through this tree to all of these, um, you know, more complicated modes of thinking. So by the 1860s, object lessons are really in schools across the United States. And that was something really unexpected and exciting that I discovered in my research on this, that as I said earlier, the object lesson metaphor had hid a lot of this history. It had hid the fact that no object lessons were a thing and they were in schools all over the United States. And that children in primary school and even a little bit older were learning about the world through objects in a structured way in their classrooms. So some of the ways that I got at this was not just through um, you know, published curricula, but also looking at things like um, you know, teacher's notebooks, this case from um, what's now Hunter College, which what was then the New York City Normal School, you know, looking at how they were using everyday objects to try to teach concepts, in this case, thinking about angles, uh, or looking at public sources, um, published sources, like this example from Harper's Weekly, in which a teacher is, in this case, teaching children about the concept of a sphere, you know, connecting 
the sphere in her hand, you know, similar to these um, geometrical forms and solids, to the globe on the floor and thinking about where and how you might see connections among different shapes in the world around you. So thinking about bringing um, objects and other kinds of pedagogical aids into the classroom. The same sorts of things are happening um, in classes in which students are learning about natural history too. Um, I love this image of his teacher holding up this um, poor suffering turtle to all of her students. And as you look around the room, realizing that this room is surrounded by um, you know, various kinds of posters and other pedagogical aids that are helping one understand different qualities of this, um, this turtle, this specimen on display that could help connect um, this one object of focus, this specimen, to these bigger ideas that might swirl around it. And so the classroom is set up to do this kind of work. Um, and so by the time you're in um, the 1860s, um, training and object lessons was offered in most normal schools across the US. Um, <clears throat> and you know, even state teacher exams, like by the early 1860s were explicitly asking teachers if they had had experience um, or practice giving object lessons. Uh, and so it was really a standard part of um, a standard part of the curriculum in the mid 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> looking at this image here, it can help us understand a little bit, um, you know, what the Chicago Tribune meant when it described what object lesson pedagogy was really about in the 1860s. Um, noting uh, here in an 1862 quote about object lessons from the Chicago Tribune, the new feature in teaching now being rapidly introduced everywhere is object lessons. The idea simply is to present an object for a lesson instead of a picture or description of some object. So in this case, we have a turtle being held up. This real object being theoretically a nucleus around which is to be grouped the facts and relations pertaining to that object. So starting with the thing, you could develop all of these ideas around it, right, as a central pedagogical tool, okay? Um, and this became, as I said, incredibly popular. So it's happening in the classroom in these ways. Um, we start to see new pedagogical tools being developed. Um, and I have to say this, um, this object here is um, was one of my favorite research discoveries when I was doing research at Princeton in the Coatsin Children's Library there. And I opened a you know acid-free box and literally found this cookie in it, which was um, a rather um, surprising moment. And it showed me that they have excellent storage there since they clearly had preserved the cookie for decades, um, not eaten by any critters. Um, but these kinds of object lesson cards were sort of another part of this, in this case, trying to use a combination of material things and text, and in some cases, images, to explain um, the idea of wheat. Like, how do you explain what wheat is unless you're able to connect it to the things that might be made from wheat or um, a range of objects that could help you understand its material qualities, okay? so. These ideas ended up being developed in lots of different directions that were intended to help children understand um, connections between, again, material qualities and much bigger ideas about the world. Um, and these sorts of lessons were really rooted in that five-step process that I shared. So thinking about observation, thinking about the qualities of objects, and particularly thinking about qualities that you could get through the senses and then what are qualities that you can't get through the senses that you have to bring to your study of that object? And then how might we sort or understand these things in categories? And then finally writing. Um, so these object lesson processes really gave teachers and young people a structured way to move from object to idea. The same kind of process was also applied to the study of pictures. Um, in some cases, um, like pictures of moral scenes and I was able to get at this in my research because these pictures, like many of the objects that are part of object lessons, actually had curricula and instructions that went along with them that really instructed and taught teachers how to invite children into this work, right? Like how to actually talk through these images or these possibilities, what questions to ask. So looking at this image, part of what teachers were trying to help students develop is that a quality of this image 
um, is, is kindness. We can see what are some of the qualities of this image? Like, what does it mean for this young girl to be helping this woman who is blind across a bridge? What are some of the qualities that we could pull out of that? Or what are some of the qualities that we might pull out of an image that is featuring um, a man coming home to his family on Saturday night, not going out into the world with his friends, but what are the qualities of a happy home? What are the qualities of an industrious man that we could pull out of this image? So a lot of these approaches and ideas feel really relevant and connected, I think, to um, some of the ways we might analyze images, even from an art historical perspective today, which I think is pretty fascinating to consider. You know, how might we um, think about histories of getting information from objects and images in these contexts? Um, one really fascinating development that grew out of object lessons was also um, the kindergarten movement and thinking about histories of um, kindergarten. That's also a big part of this sort of pedagogy. Um, and it you know, travels along parallel lines, like Froebel was someone who would all, who is the um, you know, originator of kindergarten, studied with Pestalozzi as well. Um, and so we see lots of connections um, from object lesson pedagogy to kindergarten and also Montessori education um, in the 21st century. But there are also a lot of complexities and some really fascinating and some challenging and difficult ways in which object lesson pedagogy was used in the 19th century as well. So one of those categories um, is ways in which object lesson approaches and this really material-based education was used um, for what was called kitchen garden which was a variation on kindergarten, but in this case was used to teach young girls about um, service work and um, was a way of using object lesson pedagogy, which in a kindergarten context was supposed to be very open-ended and inspiring and teaching you to go from object to idea, but instead using, um, using the kindergarten methods and the object lesson methods to teach girls how to um, respond to the demands of being in service without anxiety so that they would learn how to control their bodies and faces. So no one would you know, know what they were thinking or feeling um, and really thinking about how kindergarten methods that were designed to teach children about their environments um, could teach them really how to feel like servants and how to learn how to um, you know, control the objects around them and their own responses and feelings um, to those objects. Um, and so in a kitchen garden context, the same methods were used um, in really different ways, perhaps teaching pupils how to identify order, you know, whether a crease was straight or cutlery was parallel, um, just as under other kinder kindergarten students might be learning about primary and secondary colors or how to differentiate a sphere from a cube. Uh, in kindergarten, songs and work were really used um, to teach young people um, how to um, how to behave like servants, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and this was viewed as a uh, as a response to you know what was often described in the late nineteenth century as um, like a servant girl problem, and that. Um, it was unclear who would be doing um, service work. And so this approach was one that really, I would say, um, misapplied object lesson methods and the emancipatory possibility of kindergarten methods to um, teach girls what it felt like to be in service. Um, and so there's this really fascinating history and I've only touched on it briefly, but I, write more about this in, um, in, great, in great detail uh, in my book on object lessons, but it's sort of a fascinating way in which the pedagogy was used. Another really important theme to think about in relation to the history of object lessons is um, as it connects to histories of race and race relations. Um, now in a school in New York State near Oswego where object lessons was very popular, a lesson on cotton like this one um, as part of the, the kinds of object lesson cards I shared earlier, um, you know, might be about textile production. A student might look at this and have a relationship to this object as a consumer or as a potential consumer, right? Looking at the different kinds of, um, you know, bookbinders cloth or printed calico um, 
that you might be able to have or use from a consumer perspective. But when these same materials were used um, in the context of schools primarily serving African-American students, particularly students whose parents um, or grandparents had been enslaved or who potentially were um, living in contexts where their family members were sharecroppers, these kinds of materials might have a very different resonance. Um, and indeed, these pedagogical materials were um, not always looked at as favorably. Parents would argue, I want my children to be learning from books. I want my children to be reading. I don't want them engaging with uh, you know, rock cotton necessarily in the classroom. And so this was something that was also a very contentious way in which this pedagogy was used because objects, of course, mean different things in different contexts to different people who have a different kind of commodity relationship to those objects or to those materials. Um, so this was a really fascinating part of object lessons history as well. You know, in this case, you see students, um, you know, learning directly from um, in this case, you can see um, sort of the balls of cotton still on these branches here in this classroom. Um, and this um, is from the normal school that was attached or the, the, the normal school and practice school that was attached to the Hampton Institute um, where object lessons were a really big part of the curriculum. Another aspect in which object lessons were used, and this is something that um, I also write about at length in my book and we'll just talk about briefly here, is um, that object lessons were often applied also to the study of people. They were applied and used to talk about um, the bodies particularly of African-American and Native American students um, at places like Hampton, but also more broadly. Um, this is a very famous photograph that I'm sharing with you of a man named Lewis Firetail. And in this case, Firetail um, later fire is the man who is dressed in this regalia. This regalia is not um, connected to his own um, particular tribal identity. He is likely, in the words of historian Phil Deloria, you know, playing Indian in this context, dressing up, because he's probably been told to do that by, um, by his teacher in this case. And he's really presented in this image, you know, as an object lesson in this context and described that way. And at places like Hampton um, and in other contexts, you know, like the Carlisle Indian School, um, and in other 19th century pedagogical contexts, object lesson pedagogy was particularly used to talk about African American and Native American students, particularly in terms of how they would be transformed through these educational experiences. And you may be familiar with these kinds of um, very difficult images that um, we have seen more and more of um, as there have been more and more meaningful conversations around. Um, the um, boarding schools that Native students were sent to, but the idea of transforming students into a person that looked like a citizen, at least according to this object lesson pedagogy of, did someone look the way they should look in order to be, um, to be someone who was uh, you know, valued according to the way one appeared, applying the object lesson idea to actually people's bodies. Um, and this is something I talk about at much greater length um, in the larger, in, in the book. Um, and it's important to understand that the object lesson idea was applied and used in the classroom, but when it was applied to people and to their stories and lives, um, it, it really set up, um, it set up a pattern in which one had to look or appear a certain way in order to be, um, you know, an object lesson of, you know, what, what is a good graduate? What is someone who's successful look like? And it really set up a conversation around um, how people appeared rather than um, one's individual rights, just based on one's humanity. And, um, you know, this was a big part of rhetoric coming out of schools like Hampton and Tuskegee and Carlisle. Um, and the object lesson idea was strongly used in this context. I'm sharing an image here with a quote from Booker T. Washington that you know, his school is sending out a class of leaders who go out among their people as object lessons. And this history and this way of applying object lesson pedagogy that moved from object to idea, from observation to composition is a really interesting way to think about how we understand and talk about stereotypes, how we understand and talk about um, the ways in which um, 
we make sense of the material world around us. And when these ideas are applied to the study of people, um, you can end up with some um, really disturbing and challenging outcomes. Um, these are the kinds of things I sometimes think about in terms of like histories of racial profiling and stereotyping, like how might the object lesson idea, which suggests that um, you know, through what you observe, you can develop a whole world of ideas about a material thing. You can develop a whole world of ideas about a person. Um, and this was really central to um, this late 19th century mode of thinking. Um, and as I said, I'm only just um, sharing a little bit about this. There's a lot more to say and um, a lot more um, that I share in my uh, larger book on this topic. Now, in the late 19th century, the object lesson idea really starts um, to disappear from the classroom as you get into the late 19th and early 20th century. And it becomes something that is very much a part of um, advertising and popular culture. So you start to see object lessons being used in ads, like this ad for soap, right? Um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, what are all the qualities of something like a bar of soap that you would want to use? So again, like the qualities of this material thing being something that helps make an argument for it. Um, and there are lots of examples of object lessons being used in, um, in advertising and also literary examples as well. And that's when it begins to kind of disappear into this metaphorical context that we started with today. Object lessons also appear in all kinds of interesting ways in political ads. Um, one of my favorites is this example. This is a McKinley tariff object lesson, um, which is actually printed on tin cards. So again, you know, it's an object lesson, but it's this moment where we see, um, you know, the tin card in your hand in this case is made of imported tin plate. There was an almost identical tin card made of domestic tin plate. And it was, you know, a lesson in how do we understand the difference? The argument being there, there was no difference in this context. Um, but these objects, object lessons, these approaches really become rhetorical tools well beyond the ways in which they were used in the classroom in some pretty fascinating ways. And that's where they start to really kind of almost disappear into metaphor. Um, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, you know, prior to my, uh, you know, time at Madison, I spent a lot of time at the Chipstone Foundation thinking about um, material culture, critical museum practice, and making period rooms. And in my time at Chipstone and in my museum career, I've thought a lot about how object lessons and ways of moving from object to ideas are really central to um, the ways we tell stories with objects in museums. And in doing that, it's important to understand some of the more challenging aspects of this history, which I shared today, as well as the emancipatory goals of object lessons in terms of moving from close looking at material things to hopefully opening up whole worlds and questions and possibilities through um, you know, how training perception and sensation could give you the opportunity to think more meaningfully about, um, about the world around you. And this was something that when I worked at Chipstone, I thought a lot about through the kinds of period room projects that we did, you know, whether it was, um, you know, making a 1970s period room. Um, I'm not sure if there would be a place for such a period room at the DR Museum. Uh, but these kinds of period room projects really allowed us to think about you know, how do we tell stories with things? What are the ideas embedded in the things around us? You know, or um, one of my favorite projects, Mrs. M's Cabinet, a late 19th century period room we created at the Mock Art Museum. And in these instances, thinking about how do you move from object to idea? How do we move from object to idea, um, you know, without necessarily doing some of the the damage of the stereotypical thinking that object lessons sometimes invited in the 19th century. And so at Chipstone, we really developed this five-step object lesson um, process, which can be used in the contemporary classroom as well. And this is something that's very much part of my teaching and research today as a professor. And it's something that is also very connected to contemporary material culture discourse. How do we think about moving from object to idea in a museum setting? So just like those five steps that I shared with you earlier, 
with object lesson pedagogy, you're starting with basic description, initial observations, you're thinking about an object's physical qualities, perhaps if you're looking at a piece of furniture, its appearance and construction, its associative qualities, you know, what are historical and metaphorical possibilities? How might you classify or arrange it? What would you compare it to? And then finally, you know, synthesizing that information and interpreting it, putting it all together. So if we're thoughtful about it, there are ways in which the ob object lesson pedagogy and its history can become a useful guide um, for thinking about objects in a 21st century material culture museum studies context. And indeed, that's a big part of what I do with my own students in our classroom context, having them go through these steps with objects, you know, having them understand that this methodology needs to be applied, you know, to things, not to people, obviously, as I shared a little bit about in my presentation today. Um, but really thinking about how this five step process can open up and make possible new ways of engaging with things in the 21st century classroom, just as it did in the 19th century classroom. So with that, um, I will stop talking and hopefully answer some questions. Well, thank you, Sarah. We appreciate that. That was really cool. Uh, I answered some questions okay. as we are going in the Q&A. Um, so just to let people kind of know what those answers were, um, some of them were technical stuff. But uh, one person had a question about, if do we does the DAR Museum have any object lesson boxes? Uh, and the answer is no, we do not. Uh, but we do follow uh, Dr. Carter's example of the object lesson. Uh, Kevin, our curator of education, has used this to present a couple different programs online where he will pick an object at random from our collection and kind of walk everyone through uh, that particular uh, that object and what it means and what we can glean and what we can read from that that may not be immediately obvious. Uh, for example, like a posthumous drawing of Abraham Lincoln that has uh, some anachronisms in it because there's a um, the capital is in the background, but all of his children are alive. So you can tell that it's not <laughs> right. it's not real uh, right. in that um, because of the different historical context. And right. you can see those on our YouTube page. And if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and pop them in the Q and A, and I will read those out loud as well. And right. the other question was kind of like, what is a hands-on way to use the object lesson like in a museum setting uh, so you're not actually using historical objects? Yeah, well, it depends on the context. So, um, you know, whenever possible, like in, a, let's say in a, in a teaching setting, for me, I work with lots of curators and we have our own collection where I think it's really important to teach students how to engage with museum objects, right? So, um, we do lots of museum visits and I teach them care and handling and we actually spend time materially engaging with things, but that's in a university classroom setting, right? In a, um, in a museum setting where it's public facing, I think there are ways in which you can use reproduction objects. I think there are ways in which you can have a hands-on collection that um, you can invite people to engage with. And then I think you just have to be creative. So for example, right now in the Questioning Things exhibit, that I shared an image of at the very beginning. Um, let me go back to that. Um, you'll see here in uh, in the back of this space here, these there are a whole bunch of chairs. You know, we basically purposefully were able to get a number of chairs that people can sit in, like really cool and interesting historical chairs and contemporary chairs that we borrowed from the Chipstone Foundation, with the sole purpose of saying these are objects that you can sit in and touch. And I've actually had my students engaging with those um, through the lens of the object lesson, right? And so it just needs to be in some ways a goal to say, like, how might we create an exhibit that invites this kind of engagement? And when I'm doing exhibition projects, that's something I'm very consciously thinking about. Like, how do we create, how do we scaffold those experiences? Because if not, you just end up with, and you can just end up with an experience that's just about walking through quickly and looking instead of thinking about engagement. And so in order to make that engagement possible, you really have to be creative about it um, and have that be one of your goals. Um, I think there are lots of ways that you can have hands-on possibilities in exhibition spaces. Um, 
you just have to have that be something you want to do and that you're committed to. And do you have a favorite object lesson that you'd like to share? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, you know, let's see. I have to say, I, I think I did share my, one of my favorites here just because, um, it is such a bizarre, such a bizarre thing. Um, and that thinking about what does it mean to do a lesson on something that, um, you know, is like, is food something that is transitory, like, you know, finding this and thinking like, wow, this might be the only 140 year old cookie out there. Um, you know, just kind of wondering like what kinds of, um, what kind of world or possibilities just thinking about trying to capture and make permanent and stitch down things that are not going to survive, but then they somehow do survive um, into a set of lessons about a concept like wheat. Um, I find this object lesson just particularly fascinating for those reasons, um, because it's really an interesting set of goals to try to understand like how might we begin to imagine um, something that's an everyday substance like wheat um, through the lens of these different commodities, these lens of these different products, through the lens of all of the different material possibilities that that substance makes possible. Um, and so it's in these kinds of lessons that um, I think there's some really interesting intellectual problems that can be developed and pulled out. And do you think there's a place um, in the modern classroom for object lessons, or is it really now the museum's responsibility to kind of take on this different aspect of learning? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think um, I think they do come into the modern classroom in unexpected ways. So Montessori, for example, um, is if we were to draw a family tree of object lessons um, and this sort of um, a, sort of the intellectual history of object lessons, um, Montessori would be on this family tree as well, right, along with kindergarten. So it absolutely fits in in that context. Um, and I do think that um, when we think about sensory learning and we think about all of the different diverse ways in which people learn, um, objects can be a great way to do that, especially if it's done thoughtfully. So what you want to avoid, um, is just replacing this sort of approach, like just replacing, um, you know, this sort of um, five-step approach, like with um, rote learning. Like right? you don't want to hold up an object and say this is this means this, right? But if the lesson is actually used to invite engagement, invite um, close looking, invite skill development, and like invite connection making. Um, invite bringing in a whole range of other topics and ideas that don't exist just within the world of that thing. And then finally being used as an opportunity for writing or synthesis, I think that's fantastic. Um, but not as just another form of rote learning or not just um, you know, as an illustration of a concept. And this is something that I know a lot of um, museum folks and art historians and material culture scholars think about that a lot of times um, images of objects or images in books, they're just illustrations, they're not used as evidence. And that can be really tricky, right? That's a pretty picture, that's why I'm including it. Like, no, For, through an object lesson perspective, the idea would be I'm including this object or I'm including this theme because it opens up um, a meaningful opportunity for conversation, connection, analysis, extension, possibly composition. So yeah, I think there's a place for it but I did, you know, quite, um, it's an, even though it feels in a little bit like a slightly different topic, it's important to share some of the complicated, you know, class dimensions within the history of object lessons, like through the kitchen garden example that I brought up. And also um, the complex connections in object lessons and histories of, um, you know, racism or racist thinking too, right? So that's part of the history of this practice. So I think it's also really important to understand that um, what are ways that moving from object to idea can be made meaningful that are fundamentally different from the ways in which it was used historically and really just applied to the study of material things in a thoughtful, academic, and richly contextual way. All right. Well, thank you that you've made it through all of the questions that our audience had. Um, so is there anything like any last minute uh, thoughts that you want to share 
No, just um, I hope that this um, five-step process can be useful to people and they're visiting museums or thinking about objects out in the world, objects folks might have in their own homes or collections or objects that you might find in an antique shop or out in the world and just really thinking about um, what are the processes through which objects connect to ideas or objects can contain knowledge and just inviting everyone um, to be thoughtful about the ways in which those ideas might be developed, right? And, and we had one last question come in. Oh, is, sure. is show and tell part of the um, ah. elementary school <laughs> object lesson? Yes, in a way. I mean, it, it comes from that same sort of impulse, right? To think about how we move from um, object to idea, using an object to open up a story. So yes, it's part of that history. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. I, our audience really enjoyed it. And um, we will uh, post this on our YouTube page probably by the end of the week. So if you want to come back and see it or uh, look at the five-step object lesson, uh, take a screenshot of that or something, we'll have it up online soon. So thank you very much, Dr. Carter. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.